There is no bigger name in the Canadian theatre world than David Mervish. So when he hired world-renowned architect Frank Gehry to come up with a dramatic new design for redeveloping part of downtown Toronto, everyone assumed it would be smooth sailing. But it wasn't. The city's chief planner, Jennifer Kiesmat, had some major problems with the plan and she refused to approve it. Here to pick up the story, we welcome David Mervish and Jennifer Kiesmat. It's good to have you two here in our studio tonight. Let's start with this. Uh, Sheldon, if you would, let's bring up the picture. This is what you, is it two years ago now, unveiled to the world with what you wanted to do with a piece of downtown Toronto. That's Frank Gehry's design. What did you like about what he was putting forward then? Well, I think the premise for it was that we were going to create an active base that would uh, have six floors of activity, whether or not you used, lived in the building or not and then take whatever density was required to pay for what it was that we were putting in the base. And we went through hundreds of programs to get to, to that point, probably uh, 25 or 30 schemes before we uh, got to the image you're, you're showing where um, we really were creating three different sculptures coming out of a candelabra. And, uh, condominiums? It, yes. How many the people would have above, about. 26, 2700 condominiums, uh, but their purpose was to support an art museum and their purpose was to support uh, intellectual activity. And uh, the, we felt that we had played a role in developing that type of activity in that neighborhood, in the entertainment district, and that we wanted to continue to play a role. There. This is for, for people who don't know, this would have been near all of the theaters that you own in that area. Yes, it would have been near the Royal Alexandra, but unfortunately one of the costs of doing this project would have been that we would have had to take down the Princess of Wales, which was something that none of us really wanted to do. And, and uh, a difficult decision, but every time we looked at the plans, uh, it was better without it if we were going the route that we were going at that time. Okay, Jennifer Kiesmate, you saw that design, you looked at it, and what did you think? Well, we immediately had some, some concerns, and the challenge of being a city planner is that we, uh, we, we have to evaluate things from a technical perspective as opposed to simply getting excited about the architecture. So there were some key considerations for us, and really a threshold issue that was critical were four designated heritage buildings on the site. And the uh, proposed treatment simply removed those four buildings. We were very concerned about that. We were concerned about the changing character, in part because this is a cultural corridor. The legacy of this site is, co is cultural. John Street is cultural. Uh, so removing the cultural uses, such as the theater, was, was a concern. We were also concerned with just the overall scale of the project. This was introducing a scale that had never been anticipated before. How tall were those buildings going to be? So the tallest building, I believe, was... I think it was 86, but it was 82, 84, and 86. There was, there, there was a lot of density there, and it was really to support the base. But what was interesting was that we entered up into a, a series of consultations uh, and in the consultation process, all sorts of different groups that had interests, including the planning department, began to explain what it was that was the problem. I'm not a developer by nature or experience, so I needed to hear this in order to understand what the problems were. And as I heard them, by the time we'd had the end of the third consultation, I could see there were two routes you could go you could dilute down what we ha had here, or you could start again with a slightly different premise, but still retaining all the cultural aspects of it. And I knew that neither Frank nor I would want to compromise the quality of what we were doing. So we had to gamble that we might make something even better if we began all over with a new attitude, holding parts of what we had. And what really triggered it was a comment that Charlie Bailey who is, used to be head of Toronto Dominion Bank said, he said, under today's rules, we couldn't hire Mies van der Rohe and build the TD Center because that old building would have been landmarked and we couldn't have taken it down. So are you suggesting she was being a stick in the mud about too much? No, I'm saying that we have different rules today mm -hmm. and that we should look at those rules on a larger, broader spectrum at some later time and think about what our heritage rules are 
But my family actually helped to create those rules. Mm -hmm. We uh, didn't have them until we saved the Royal Alexandra Theatre. Okay, so this was a legacy of our own doing. Let me find out from you how protracted the negotiation. I mean, clearly, this is something, this is a billion dollar project, mm -hmm. right? Would yes. have been mm -hmm. a billion dollars. I mean, you can imagine the assessment for the city, the taxes this would have brought in, the jobs, and so on, and you're giving him mm -hmm. a hard time about mm -hmm. it. Um, how tough were the negotiations? Mm -hmm. Well, the catch-22 that you have in any project with the city is that there can be a tremendous number of benefits, but you want to mitigate the negative implications. So if you're bringing in a large tax assessment, but quality of life is decreasing as a result of a project, then we're not building a very great city. So that's a catch-22. So the, um, the negotiations were tough, and they were tough in part because uh, we needed to get really to that tipping point, that critical moment where in David's mind and in Frank Gehry's mind, there was uh, really a willingness or an opportunity to really rethink this. And to be clear, city planning, we came forward with an alternative proposal that was a bit of a cut and a paste job. Um, and we were trying to push some of the thinking, but David and his team weren't there yet. Uh, and we were, we were very hopeful. And in one of the meetings, it was, it was really interesting when we were talking about the importance of the heritage buildings, uh, someone around the table said, you know, Frank Gehry's the greatest architect in the world. Surely he can come up with a plan to integrate these heritage buildings into this site so that we're not wipe wiping the slate clean. And it did feel like a little bit of an aha moment, a recognition that what we have here is a creativity challenge. Like it's about the creativity that needs to be brought to the, to the project. So I think once we hit that critical moment, which was quite a few months ago, um, until we hit that critical moment, the conversations were difficult. They were difficult for David. They were very difficult for me. It was actually quite painful because I think both of us want to do something spectacular in the city, uh, but we couldn't quite figure out how to bring our conversations together. But once we got over that tipping point and once we began to see some very new and different ideas beginning to come from the architectural team, then it got exciting. So what are you going to do now? Oh, okay. <laughs> do you have an image of what I don't. We, you don't, okay. It's top secret still. <laughs> uh, but, this, but this doesn't go on the air till after six o'clock, right? <laughs> Correct. So, okay. Um, we, uh, we originally had this idea of a candelabra with three separate sculptures. Let's bring that shot up again. Maybe you yeah. can tell us how, how the design will be different. Yeah. We could have compromised that one by taking architectural elements from the historic building and adding them in and diminishing the size and fiddling around with that. Instead, I didn't like the solution that often happens here, which is that we take a piece of the building and we save that and we stick it onto something or keeping the outside walls and building within them. So I listened very carefully, and when I was heard that they wanted to save architecture, I thought, let's save an entire warehouse. So we've saved the white ware warehouse, which is at the west end of the site. And on the top of it, Frank will build me a jewel box of 9,200 square feet for an art foundation, which is large enough to do major exhibitions in. Uh, once we had saved the warehouse, I felt that the building that was closest to my heart, even though it wasn't designated at the time, was the theater, because I had put years of my life into building it. And although I only used my four theaters for last year 100 per weeks of performance, and this year I have 121 weeks, I felt, let's save the theater so and the we'll grow going into to, it. The so we're going, going to, to save saved. the Princess of Wales Theater. So now we have a warehouse and the Princess of Wales Theatre, and we don't have the context. The context of the Princess of Wales Theatre was that it was built in 1993 at a time when all of us were interested in infill and relationships to what existed. And so we decided to save the front of the Anderson Building, which is a hollow tile building and is architecturally the most interesting building. But are you doing condo towers still? Oh yes, we're doing separate things. We're, do, we're, we're preserving the past all the way back to the Whiteware Building and the Anderson. We're talking about Canada, Toronto in 1993 by saving the theatre. And then we're giving Gary two independent buildings that talk about where Toronto is in the year 2014. And they're joined by Edmervish Square between them 
and a redesigning of the street, and, street and getting rid of the sidewalks, still being able to use it for cars, but also being able to use it for festivals, and looking at this in a totally different light. Now we have two towers that the model for Frank was Rockefeller Center, and two buildings that, that talk to each other in terms of relationship. How tall are they? And the space in between. Well, you have to understand how the tallness works. The building is built in segments, and when you get to the first shoulder, those shoulders relate to the buildings that now exist around me, like TIFF. They then go up in block in increments, so that you create a clothesline up to the top, and they're 92 and 82 stories. Okay, let me go to Jennifer on this. Why is this, from a city planner's point of view, better? Well, it has to begin with the narrative that David's just outlined in the new proposal around the heritage buildings. So this is a very context-specific proposal. It's a very Toronto project, uh, which is in fact how Frank Gehry described it, described it last week. It builds on the assets that already exist along the corridor. So that's, that, that's critical. Mm -hmm. The second key piece is the public realm. We were concerned about the character of the public realm, the sidewalks, the streets, the setback of the building now, the new buildings, in fact, allows for corner squares as well as Ed Mervish Way turned into a, a, a public square, like a Wooner, for you. You don't have any curb cuts, you've got a higher design quality and design treatment, so it in fact becomes a part of the public realm and a public space for gathering. The third critical key change here, which is very exciting, is the cultural elements that are maintained. The gallery is brought down to the, to the street level on the corner of John Street. The retaining of the theatre, from our perspective, is an absolute, uh, an absolute priority and a wonderful, a wonderful headache, opportunity. Headache for him. He's no, I, a, no, I love it. I, I, no, I, but you, got a, you, you couldn't fill it last year. Now, you, I mean, right? I have the room to grow. You know, I've moved from 100 weeks last year to 121 this year. We have 200 different language groups in the city of Toronto. How do we engage them all to want to come to theatre? I mean, it's a great challenge. Mm -hmm. Having the four theatres to work with just gives me inventory of weeks. So I'm not, I'm not concerned with that. I'd like to keep growing the theatre. It's what I do for a living. Right. Will you have fewer people living here now? Living in, oh yes. In the building. So it was no, 2,600 before. This is 25% less density, this is 600 less apartment units, but it's not required because it, that was required when we were a larger art museum. What we still have is a home for OCAD for curatorial studies and fine art history and live performance art. So they still take their space within this building and as I say we have a, uh, a jewel box of, uh, 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 of art foundation. So that, that is a value and what we really gain is we gain the theater. Is he mad at you though because you, he's a businessman well, and you did take money out of his pocket by well, forcing no, a small... Well no that's not actually true. Okay. Um, in part because in part, a very important part of the conversation for us was we did a pro forma analysis and we compared the scheme that we had prepared in city planning which was between a 25 and 30 percent reduction in the scale of the project. We compared that to the proposal and in order to have some good data and actual information around financial viability because it is a critical part of planning practice. And uh, what we discovered is you do hit, you do hit uh, a point of diminishing returns in part because it's about market absorption and the longer it takes you to bring a condo market, uh, a condo unit to the market, the more expensive it becomes. So there's actually a moment where the absorption slows down so significantly on a large scale project that those units start to become much more costly to carry. Hmm. So in doing our comprehensive analysis, we we're able to understand the implications of making the project uh, smaller. Uh, so that was a really important piece in the, on the city planning side. I talked about the heritage and the public realm, uh, but another critical piece from our perspective was the scaling down of the project because we were concerned about the magnitude of the project and its impact. So the scaling down involves less units, it involves uh, a smaller project. Even though we still have very, very tall towers, those towers now have a small 
smaller footprint and they're narrower. Mm -hmm. And they've also been articulated in a very interesting way that I think mitigates um, the negative impacts and adds a tremendous amount of visual dimension to the skyline. So 92 towers, 92, 92. floors is the taller one, right? That's the taller and one. And that would make it, what, the third tallest building in, in the downtown? Does that sound about right? I have no idea. It's pretty close. It might be the pretty. second, actually. Second? Yeah, it's, pre it's pretty close. Huh. But, but the real point is that we're engaged in architecture. My original goal was to say something about us as a community, that, our, that we have a place in the world and that we shouldn't shirk from it. We should not be ashamed to be visible. And Frank Erie is okay with this? And Frank is thrilled with this. Fra I think we have a better project. I think in the end we have better buildings. I think that the buildings have a dignity to them. I think that they have a look to them that unfortunately we can't show you on the screen to hear. But am I hearing but right? You are happier with what you've ended up with than where you started. You have to look at the buildings. The buildings are beautiful. And that's, in the end, what we were going for. That was the first goal. Because you impress me as a guy who probably doesn't get told what to do very often. I don't, I don't add just... much. <laughs> I, don't, you know, I don't worry about whether it's... I, you know, I know that Frank isn't going to design something that can't be built and can't meet the marketplace because he wants to see his buildings get built. What he needs is clear direction from a client and clear rules to deal with. So once we recognized we were saving heritage, my concern was that we save heritage in a meaningful way. What upsets me when I see the saving of heritage is when I sit in the Toronto Dominion Bank building, uh, not Toronto Dominion Bank, Toronto General Hospital, look across the street at uh, Princess Margaret. It's one of the five great research hospitals in North America. And when you walk in, you want to feel they're going to save your life. And you walk in through an old entrance that doesn't tell you that message. They have a modern building hiding behind it, and we have rules that force them to give the wrong message for the job they do. And that's not Jennifer's fault. And that's, it's just how we go about regarding what is heritage and what isn't. It's a different question. That's a, that, that sounds like we should get you two back for another show on that <laughs> issue, because that sounds like a good one. I don't know if you're friends now, but I guess you're not enemies anymore. So that, I that's actually, a pretty good thing. I actually think we've come to a place where we're both trying to build a better city and where we've succeeded together. We've come out with a solution that's better than when we started, and it's taken us both time to recognize our needs. And we've found a good solution for the city, I hope. Terrific. And we're grateful both of you came in tonight to talk about it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Jennifer Keysmet, David Mervish. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.